what month? Do you know? Oh, well, uh, we, we haven't um, addressed this schedule directly, but um, we will probably start with uh, town meeting day issues and candidate forums in the January meeting. Great. Okay. So, you know, the school budget and candidates and those, those kinds of issues uh, will resurface for January. And uh, for those, anybody who hasn't really focused on the calendar, town meeting day is actually March 7th this year. So it gives us another whole week, actually two weeks between our February meeting at the end of February and town meeting day. So it gives us a little more space to split the candidate forum town meeting day issues between the January and February meeting. So that's kind of where I see our planning going. And of course, when we get together for a steering committee meeting next week, we can hash that all out. Well, we're not meeting in December. So we won't meet until the beginning of January. Oh, well, oh, I, I thought we were having our meeting in December. Yeah, okay, well, yeah, all right, we'll figure that out. Because we... <laughs> Jeff? Yes? Yeah, see, I was going to show up at Jeff's office and nobody was going to be there. I probably would So, yeah, oh, I guess that's another opportunity to say that we are going to skip the December meeting. Okay. There will be no December NBA meeting because that would fall on the week between uh, Christmas and New Year's. So we're going to try to work on our planning in the meantime. But Mark says they're adjourning now, so it might be 20 minutes from now. OK. All right, so uh, with that, um, Sarah, can sure. I invite you to the? Yep. Why don't you sit at the laptop? OK. Okay. Musical changes. Okay. <laughs> right. So, um, so before Sarah gets up and rolling, I guess we'd like to open the floor. That are there any uh, questions that folks have uh, for you know topics for discussion with the city councilors that you'd like to put on the on the floor to start with. I oh, would Bridget. just like to say that I and among many citizens I'm sure are extremely happy that construction is finally happening downtown Burlington and that our downtown will come back to its life and um, so thank you whoever was involved with that. I'm sure the city council mayor, but uh, we've cast, cast a thousand. A thousand. <laughs> but it's, it's very exciting. exciting. Yeah. A lot of work to be done. Yeah. We're moving. Okay. And equally as big, um, the North Avenue was paid since yes. we last yes. met. Yes. yes. Oh. Does anyone know what's happening on the corner of 127 and North Avenue? What's that? Oh, that's a good question. Do you know? It's a failed bank. bank. And there's a, a, a water outfall, which I think that has, to, I feel like I'm echoing here, but I'm not. You are. I, I just muted mine. Okay. Um, the bank is failed. And there's a water outfall, and they're doing, they're trying to stabilize the bank. So it's, it's not a great thing, and it was not expected. It's not part of the North Avenue um, paving project. It just happened. May I add something? Uh, we have one person. Have one person online with a question. So uh, Steve Hamlin. I was just wondering if the bill for the uh, recycled coder is passed. What that's going to mean for some kind of a timeline. I want to roll it out. Are you referring to the the Champlain Solid Waste District? Yes, but wasn't that a bill that was passed by the city council? Oh. Well, I guess I'm 
there's misunderstanding. There's the bond for the capital, the, the consolidated, the Tudor County Solid Waste District passed. They're going to build a new recycle, $25 million worth of recycling processing. I thought were you were asking about the toters. Um, I wasn't. Was the question about the toters? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Sorry. I I need to refresh myself. We if last I knew, we've ordered four thousand new toters and they're sort of backlogged. So we we passed the requirement that everybody will have a toter. There's a phase in period to um, for people to do that. And I think the um, Burlington waste people are going to be advertising that. So um, by a deadline, and I think it's late winter, everyone's going to have to get themselves a toter um, that are being subsidized by um, the city. And we'll no longer have the blue boxes. Basically, that's the bottom line. And as a follow-up to Steve's question, I thought I had read somewhere or something somewhere that uh, us as residents are supposed to pay or cost share for our toters. Has yes. that requirement been waived? It has not been waived globally. There'll be individual ways to waive it. They're pretty modest in price, but you'll have to pay for a portion of your toter. If you have it picked up, you, just, <clears throat> you still have the option of doing your own recycling. So you can bring it to the waste district on um, Patton Road. At this point in time, the um, Pine Street Depot is still only accepting food um, compostables. They are trying to figure out a way to expand that. Um, could I have everyone mute themselves and their speakers? We're ready to kind of swap over now. So if everyone could mute their microphones and their speakers up to the laptop. Um, my, my gut reaction to that is, is that I'm kind of disappointed that the city's not going to uh, cover those costs um, given the amount of money that the city has spent on all sorts of other projects, I think that uh, you know, providing covering the cost of our blue holders, you know, in order to facilitate that recycling, I think is would be more than appropriate on the city's part. So that is my personal it was, view. Uh, it's about five hundred thousand um, dollars. That the city is paying, is paying. Yep. So yep. The, your contributions are to to reduce it to five hundred thousand um, dollars. And you know, again, they they uh, are willing and have all along to make so poor people who really can't pay the thirty dollars or the twenty five dollars um, that it costs for the coder. Um, they pay for the recycling. So it, you know, it's more than the communities do. And, well, there'll be the, uh, the small, the one with the cup. Okay, so that's, the, I don't know. There's three price, three sizes, three prices, I think. Like 10, 20, and 28, or something like that. All right, uh, Larry, Larry, you had a question earlier. Well, in answer to your question, um, on the Facebook, North End Forum 7, I took a whole bunch of pictures and shared that with everybody. It's, it's really a phenomenal engineering feat if you see how far down it goes and what they have to do. So it'll save North Avenue and 127 ramp. Yes, I mean, it, it, like I said, it was unplanned, but it has, can't not be done. And I do believe um, that a chunk of the cost of that is being paid with state dollars, because 127 is a state highway. Uh, and so I don't know quite how it divides itself, but we are getting support from the state. Okay, I guess that's it from the floor. So you can. Are there are there other topics on your? Um, there's always there's always lots of topics. Um, 
Um, just trying to think of what would be of most interest. Um, uh, as you all know, and uh, Mark really is the one who can inform us the best, but we've been spending a lot of time on redistricting. Um, we're sort of narrowed down to a couple of options. Um, we're hoping to consider that at our next meeting or the meeting after. Most of the discussion really doesn't end up affecting the North End. The big decision that was made to go or to continue with eight wards as opposed to seven wards was sort of the dividing point um, for the North End, the, the North Ends. Um, and that decision was made predominantly to support the interest of the new North End and the old North End of not blurring into, blurring into each other. Um, so that, that's taken a lot of time. Um, I'm really trying to think of the other sort of hot issues, so I'm definitely open to questions. Okay. So I, I know that it, I, I saw that on the last city council meeting, uh, the last city council meeting, there were several uh, charter change yes, projects. Yes, let me that, speak that about you, those. I know yes. you have been working I on. I serve on the charter change committee. There's actually um, at least three. One of them you've heard about, which is uh, a provision to allow legal non-citizens um, to vote in local elections. We've been discussing that on and off for a number of years. Um, it sort of came up just pre-COVID and then got put on the shelf and back on. In the meantime, the cities of Winooski and Montpelier have passed uh, ordinances and charter changes to reflect that. And we're really following suit. Our, our change looks very familiar, uh, similar to Winooski, and that will be on uh, the March ballot. I think I was not able to come to the September meeting, but um, I think you did hear about that. And not much has changed on that. We've been doing a lot of outreach um, with various constituencies and um, folks that will be affected, so that's going to happen. There'll be a charter change to allow more flexibility in the siting of polling places. Um, and that's really being presented as an option for a couple of reasons. Um, there's been an interest really in this end of town about whether there might be a more ref uh, flexible space. Um, and the current charter language prescribes that it be in the ward that the voting is. And this will, might allow us, for instance, to combine. Maybe we could put a polling place in the new high school for both wards. Um, as we look at redistricting, there may be some need to change. Uh, for instance, Edmonds may be affected by depending on what ward configuration. So that's, it's an option that would allow us to consider spaces either combined or not physically in the location of the ward if, if that is necessary. And that, we added language, good language, to um, do that in consultation with the ward clerks and the other elected officials. Um, so that's, that's on the matter. And then the third one is reinstituting instant runoff voting. Um, that has, uh, a, when did we do that? Two years ago, we, there was a strong interest by some number of people to bring it back. Um, at that time, there was concerns about, concerns about it. There was what I had thought was sort of a compromise, which was let's see how it works reinstituting it for council races. Uh, and that is in fact happening. It's happening next week in the East District. Um, subsequently, um, there was a group of people that wanted to reinstitute it quicker uh, for the mayor's race. And then it subsequently moved to include all elected officials, including school, school board, ward clerks, um, inspectors of election. So that's what the ballot change at the moment will reflect. And I'm, I'm happy to try to answer any questions on that. Um, um, <laughs> I mean, that, that's one that I was following and so I'm sort of, I'm I'm surprised that when yeah, when Jeff you don't need kind to keep on muting yourself. What's that? You don't need to keep on muting yourself. You're all set. Okay. Okay. It it came on fast. I yeah. um which is 
from thank you, John. From my personal perspective, I did not anticipate we were going to do it this session, and I was myself and Councillor Barlow were in the minority on that decision, and it is going forward. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> given that <clears throat> Mr. Bristow Johnson is. With us this evening, I'm, I'm going to ask this question on his behalf anyway about um, is, the, is the potential charter change provision to allow the city to redistrict without going back to the legislature, is that going to make town meeting day or not? It is not, which I personally think is unfortunate. Um, nobody was on the council opposed it. I think there was a sense that we already have three other initiatives, that it would be confusing to people to have the actual redistricting item on the ballot and, and then this other item that would allow us the um, ability to have the city council itself determine redistricting. I have been promised, and I'm saying it publicly here, by some of my peers that we will try to do that next year. Okay. So, remember I said that? and. Test me next year. Okay. Um, and that, that may appear as somewhat of an inside yeah. conversation. So if anybody is need sort of an explanation of what that question is about, you know, please raise your hand. Well, and I, and I, get, I mean, right now it's, um, we're behind schedule. Part of our problem with redistricting is we've been very governed by having to make our own decision and then we have to send it off to the legislature, which effectively s slows everything down. And there are a few communities in the state that make their own decision, basically. But the voters decide. So in either case, the voters will vote. You all will vote on a map um, in March, but the problem is it has to be in March. And that's, you know, that just doesn't always fit our timeline. And if we could get away from having to do it in March and just do it whenever it is reasonable, the Montpelier thing I think allows um, that to be considered in as little as five years. Um, I hate to think of that again, but you know, the city, I mean, one of the problems with the city is it has spots of growth that you can't predict. And so, Waiting 10 years still may keep you out of whack. Um, and there's probably an argument to be said that we should look at that every year, not that you do it every year, but you know, if you move all of a sudden and have a thousand more residents in one district, you really should do it sooner than waiting 10 years to figure it out. Thank you. At the poll, po sorry. Peter Ireland, Ward 7, at, at, at the polling, they were doing a questionnaire on whether we should allow to put things on the ballot without having to go through the city council. What, what came of that? There's a, there's a citizen group who are trying to um, gather, you know, signing petitions and support to, um, Put, put that on the ballot. Right now, um, the way our charter is written, um, we don't allow for uh, effectively referendums without a fairly high um, petition level. And so, so they want to make it essentially easier and binding to put things on the ballot. Uh, so that was a citizen initiative. It wasn't. It wasn't. It is not under active consideration at this point in time with the city council. I'm expecting in the next year we'll probably see something, but there's nothing currently about that. Thank you. Councillor Ding, is there anything that you would want to present to the NPA? Of course, of course. Thank Glad you you're here. Good uh, to see you. Thank you again and everyone for being here. Um, Representative Hooper, good to see you. Lee Morrigan, good to see you. My friend Sandrine in the back and everyone. It's been a while. And hope that you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving break and looking forward to Christmas.
So talking about Christmas, did you know that, um, what's his name? We have like someone here in the New North End that just moved here. Um, do, 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 do you know about it? Um, cousin Ellie from oh. Chevy Chase. You heard about that? Randy Quaid. <laughs> yeah, it's all over yeah. the place. He's in Ward 7. I'm like, yeah. I'm going to knock at his dog tomorrow. Inshallah. I didn't heard he, about didn't it. Didn't he buy a yeah. house on Randy Lane? Randy Lane. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> so I heard about it just uh, as a transition. Just came back from, um, you know, the Parks, Arts, and Culture Committee. And we had an extensive discussion about public safety in the parks. And today we hosted the chief of police. We also hosted um, uh, my neighbor, director of Burlington Parks and Recreation, Cindy, right? To just tell us about enforcements that need to happen in the park, especially in downtown park, city hall park. As you all know, there has been a murder not long ago. And, you know, uh, drug dealing, meth cooking, meth smoking, everything is just like a mess right now. But now we're looking into the spring of 2023. What can be done right now, like so that when spring opens and people start to come up, what can be done in terms of enforcing the city existing ordinances that already exist? Great, wonderful conversation happened, and also we all agreed that we need to move away from, from punitive approaches. You know, not a piecemeal approach, but a punitive. We need to move away from it. And as you know, the Park Patrol are doing an amazing job in terms of building relationship with people who are affected. And also, uh, this discussion will continue. And I believe that Councilor Barlow did put something on the uh, front porch forum, inviting people to show up. And that will be amazing next time. If you can show, that would be great because more perspective, the better. Evan was there today, and he brought an amazing idea that even the chief of police um, agreed upon. If Evan is here, he can talk about it more. Um, so that's one. And I think two, as you know, the racial equity, inclusion, and belonging has a new director, right? This is amazing, Clarkson, and she unfortunately she doesn't live in the new North End, but she lives in the old North End. That's good. Um, and um, you know, the, co the REIB committee is exploring the creation of a commission, just like Park Commission police commission of commission that will look into racial equity, inclusion, and belonging in the city of Burlington. I believe our next meeting is on the 20th, which is in December, four days, five days before Christmas. And we also would love people's perspective before we send it to Charlie Change in order to go to the ballot potentially in March 2023, right? Um, and I think uh, <coughs> Councillor uh, Carpenter did talk about ranked choice voting. Right, um, and basically it would be under ballot, but this time it would be for mayor as well as for um, um, the commissioners of the Burlington School District, and also you know many other um, elected officials such as the people who are taking care of the voting. Um, and um, for me, those were the most pressing issues currently in front of us. And uh, I'm happy to listen to more. And all oh, yeah, uh, Robert Press. Cooper, um, I know, uh, Representative Cooper, I know that you will do an amazing job in helping the city find the money to pay for the high school. I know you will do that. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> yes. Write us a check. Yes. <laughs> and congratulations, the commissioners, all of you, for the great job that you've done to put it on the ballot and pass by 76%. Good to see you, people. Okay. Are there any? Urgent questions? Yeah. I have a question. Okay. Um, Sarah, on the. It's, it's, it's working online. Just okay. Sarah, um, on the uh, non citizen voting question, what's the definition of residency? Is it green card holder or property owner or long term residence? It, it's legal. I, I would need to give it to you specifically, but if you have the right to be residing in the United States, so green card I think is one. I don't believe it's the only one, um, and I can get it to you. It's in the charter language, but uh, whatever allows you to legally reside here. 
yeah? which is visa, which is asylum. You have asylum, you're living in the Burlington, you can vote. You have a legal visa in the city, you can do it, and green card as well. I guess I would just like to add to that that, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, the city will have to be careful about going forward is in, in past elections, um, administrations have put city ballot items on the November general election ballots. Um, and so if, if the all resident voting passes, um, that that practice will have to stop uh, because um, you know the the city, the residents that are eligible to vote under on municipal questions under all resident voting uh, will not be allowed to uh, vote on the uh, general election ballots. Jeff, don't you technically get two separate ballots? They do them at the same election time, but. Don't you get two separate pieces of paper? Um, I believe you do. I, I mean, guess I'll, I mean, I guess I'll, instance, I guess I'll have to you know, look into that. The problem I, I, we had with the solid waste district, which is right. unrelated, but a similar problem, which was nobody remembered that we have county elections every once in a great while. Uh, okay, I, I guess I'm kind of remembering that we may have seen those. On, on the same piece of paper in the past, but yes, that would require uh, separate ballots. Yeah. And on that question, um, Mr. Hooper from Government Ops, would you like to weigh in on that topic? Yeah, Jeff, thank you. Um, and good to see you again, Mr. Ali and Matt Carpenter. Um, the first, I want to say thank you to everybody who showed up in November and checked the box that puts me here on your screen, and happy holidays. Um, we have had at least two communities that have adopted the non-citizen voting, uh, Montpelier and Brattleboro, I think. Winooski. Secretary of State, say again? It's Winooski and Montpelier. Brattleboro actually, I think, simultaneously um, is passed something similar to what we're proposing, or planning to, I believe. Yeah, but, um, there's also a legal challenge, I think, that had been entered, and I don't know if it's been resolved as to allowing that to happen, but the Secretary of State's office has been consulting with uh, how ballots need to be prepared and distributed, uh, so there is not that intermixing that you are mentioning, Jeff. You, you basically have a separate list of uh, persons who are qualified for the non-citizen ballot than people that are qualified for the broader than just the local community ballot. So if you, in Burlington, uh, your non-citizen would be able to vote on uh, school issues, but not on tech center issues because that crosses the geographic line. And, you know, that's where things get uh, a little funky similar to what happened with the solid waste district thing, uh, which was specifically excluded from that bill by the committee uh, because the, there is no conformity as to variations on lines for solid waste districts. In Burlington, it's kind of a town in the Northeast Kingdom. It's four, five, six, seven towns across three counties. Um, so those are things that they just have not worked out yet. Uh, so yeah, there we go. That's at least my choice. While I'm speaking though, I probably would, or that's uh, non-citizen. While I'm occupying your ears, I'd say that the ranked choice thing is gonna get a little touchy because when we approved ranked choice last time, um, there were a lot of representations made by the city attorney who then became a judge and other people that this was going to be a trial for the city council and be reevaluated. And at this point, it seems like uh, the camel got the nose under the tent and then the hump tried to get through too. Uh, I would not be surprised that um, 
there will be a lot of people that will want to look a lot more critically at the system that's being viewed in ranked choice and uh, how much of a uh, Pandora's box it's opening up. Because when, you know, basically a fifth of the, of the population of the state kind of falls under a particular system, it has a tendency to migrate. And if it's not the best system, then it, it deserves examination. I think you may recall that probably close to a year and a half ago, I sent out something on Front Porch Forum that basically said, do you understand what this was that you voted for? Because there are several different kinds of ranked choice voting. And I was shocked at the amount of mail I got back with people saying, I thought it was just one thing. Uh, what do you mean? Explain it to me more. Uh, so I think there's a lot more information needs to be spread out and a lot more uh, crit critical uh, parameters set up for what it needs to be. Thanks, Bob. I'm going to have to uh, sort of move on at this point, and I would definitely like to come back to that conversation in the future. But in order to obey my own rule about respecting the agenda, um, <laughs> we're going to have to move on to our next presenter. And we'll hear from Mark. Um, um, I'm going I'm to have to wait, and if we have time later on, um, Mark, we'll have to come back to you, but we're kind of already 10 minutes into our next presentation, so if you'll excuse my prerogative. Um, Sandra, yes. I would invite you to join us at the table. So the microphones do not amplify. It's oh, only, it does not. It's only for the camera. It's, it's only for the camera. Very right, good. So people online can and hear. Be but you'll have to project across the across the room. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Welcome. My, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, my name is Sandrine Kibwe. I am originally from the Democratic of Congo. And I've been a resident of uh, Ward 7 for the last, well, since 2006, when I moved to Vermont. I've been in the US for 20-something uh, years. I moved uh, to the US in 1997. And I am here today being invited, thank you very much, to talk about uh, the new New American organization that I am president of the Vermont New American Advisory Council. Um, we are a group of New Americans, leaders from different spectrum um, of um, the world. And uh, we are a group that was formed in 2020. And uh, the major um, interest that we have had to come together was for uh, the need of the New American community really to participate uh, into the civic uh, engagement process. Um, voting is, uh, as you know, a very important part of every single um, community being uh, as uh, a participation to that voting process uh, for, from most of the community uh, actually does bring that uh, feeling of a sense of belonging, uh, a sense of having a voice and really participate to what is community, which is being able to say and being able to decide on what we are all um, experiences that, uh, experiencing as a life uh, within um, the, the, the community itself. So um, the, second, the second reason why we have created, uh, which is now a 501c3 a nonprofit organization, 
uh, was uh, to dismantle all those barriers that we know are present uh, for newcomers. Um, that really uh, put uh, uh, difficulties um, when it comes to their progress and their journey for, you know, to fulfill uh, economically, uh, culturally, uh, socially uh, a life uh, to a home that is called Vermont, or to a home that is called Burlington. You know, what seven? You know that. Uh, for me, uh, so. You know, as part of our mission, which is really um, uh, it, it's really in a sense uh, uh, very important and very crucial uh, for all of us. Um, you have seen that most new American communities as today, I, I think of Ali and I, we are the, the two, the two uh, I do believe, uh, I don't know if that was the question from the other, um, uh, communities here, uh, New York communities, but are, are not present. Um, and it's not that uh, there is no will. Um, most of the group that are community leaders, they are a wide range of people that have been through the process, understand the system, understand the process. We have program managers, we have uh, directors, we have uh, really some kind of the, the, the elite there, but people that live among us are not really present. You might see uh, one or two or three or several families coming and passing through when it's time to vote. But the understanding of what that vote means and what they vote for cannot be under, under, underestimated. We have a need to make every single citizen understand why and what they are voting for. And this is what we are trying by educating our communities, really uh, uh, make them engage and participate to this process that's, that are, are, are actually uh, 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 supposed to be you know, uh, uh, a, common, a, common, a common process, a common goal. So to talk about VINAC, because I, I can go over and over for a long time mm -hmm. talking about why we have come to the point where we thought that we needed really an organization to push that, to push that uh, initiative forward. Um, we have been, um, and I don't know if you have seen uh, us, uh, VINAC, the VINAC group, but we have had uh, a few activities since the 2020 because this is when the group formed, we became a 501 c 3 mid uh, 2021 so you know COVID was right right there right so so we leave that um, but um, our major funders um, are aware and are uh, uh, the Vermont Community Foundation we were um, also funded and, and it's always through and for civic engagement civic participation to the new American community so um, uh, ARP funded us, um, and right now the city of Burlington uh, racial um, equity uh, office and belonging is also uh, funding um, some of our projects. So what have we done, uh, you may ask. Okay. So um, we have done um, a voter uh, registration drive. This gave us really a good sense of who actually were coming. So we, we, we had a, a few success in several communities, but not as we hoped, right? Um, so we knew that there were definitely uh, a, a, a problem with, I mean, we, it, this is something that we assess, right? Communication is one, information is two, um, and education three, and actually the action, uh, actually voting, and voting for whom and why. Uh, and four. Um, we have done some um, mayoral candidate forums, uh, about two or three since 2020. Um, and um, we have done also the, um, uh, the, the candidate for the election of governor in 2020. Um, we have done the mayoral uh, candidate forum in 2021. We have done another one for the Senate candidates in 2022. Um, we also have been in, um, uh, uh, we have had the opportunity to participate to 
wide range um, uh, uh, topics such as environmental justice. We were part because I, I, uh, if some of you uh, see me and uh, recognize me as uh, uh, an employee of the Champlain Valley Economic, of Economic Opportunities, because I am, uh, and sometimes I wear two hats, uh, and this is what, uh, in that sense, for environmental justice policy that was voted last, uh, this year, at the beginning of the year, we were part of the uh, testimonial team that were really pushing for that policy to be uh, voted um, uh, we have provided a, a wide range of recommendation when it comes to the future of Vermont. We have had a, um, a forums for the American communities for, uh, for them to be able actually to talk to elected officials and then ask the questions and vice versa and then really try to get to that habit of um, 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 for, for the people that are in uh, this type of decision making uh, position to be an approachable. That, only, only that. Because the, the perception that uh, all cultures are the same, it's a false. Um, there is a wide range of people that are terrified of you as because just of our title. And that put, that, 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 that ability to just be in presence and communicate, it's, a, it's, a, it's the first step, right? Communication and talking uh, is the first step. Um, we were part of the Black Experience that happened on Juneteenth this year as well. Uh, right now we are um, doing, uh, uh, you know, in the process of doing a project with the city of Burlington um, that is a, a youth and support uh, for families engaging in gun violence, that's one. Um, and um, you know, we plan on having uh, oh, you know, coming coming up uh, this type of educational, uh, really community meeting with uh, 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 an understanding and learning process to this uh, very complicated uh, uh, field that is uh, uh, devoting or the civic. Uh, a necessity for people to, to, to be there, to be present, to participate, to be engaged, and to actually know about all that you just talked about. Um, I can tell you that there is a few things that I didn't know that I just learned right now. Um, so I don't know if you have any questions. This, this is not sure, I like, really condensed what I was supposed to do, but 10 minutes, so it's, it's a long time. I don't want to mess up your agenda, <laughs> Jeff. Um, so. I can do that all by myself. <laughs> I don't know if anybody has, has questions. We, we, we are present, we are in, uh, in Burlington, and I want to, uh, to actually note that the, the way the, the website is noted on the agenda is, uh, has a mistake on it. It's a C, not a V at the end of it. It's VNAC and not uh, VNAV. I think it was. Um, but um, yeah, any questions that you might have, um, I am more than uh, pleased to answer them, if any. Yes. What would you say the organization's biggest need at this point is? It's definitely capacity. We are a very, a very, a very small group, and we, we definitely have the opportunity to have several uh, community leaders for several communities as part of this group. Uh, majorly, we have worked with the Somali Bantu community, the Congolese community, the Nepalese community, the Sudanese community. Um, but um, as you know, when it comes to anything that has to do with a topic as large as civic engagement, or as large as you know, how do you come to a sense of belonging to where, you know, where you live, you, you really, it takes time and time that we definitely don't uh, uh, have a lot to give in that sense, that the, the um, capacity for every nonprofit is an issue and it's for us uh, an issue as well. So funding is one to actually to get to the point where we might be able to get enough people to work on that very important, very, very important topic. So funding. Yes. Yes, uh, Sandrine, in um, one of 
our earlier conversations, you <coughs> made kind of a, kind of a off off the side comment about uh, you you felt like uh, many of your members would be working. So that got me thinking about sort of the community engagement process and. Um, so uh, do, you, do you see kind of a, a, a big distinction in sort of the employment patterns of your directors mm -hmm. versus most of your members mm -hmm. that, so how, how, do, how do the employment patterns of your members uh, sort of get in the way perhaps of uh, civic engagement? Mm -hmm. and, and I ask that question because as part of the steering committee, we've talked about the concept of an NPA roadshow, and we're sort of wondering, you know, do we need to be holding mm -hmm. these types of meetings at other times and places mm -hmm. to facilitate the kind of engagement that you seem to be saying is lacking? Now, could you elaborate on that, perhaps? Sure, I can. Well, um, in every sense of um, diversity, uh, that's something that should be thought about. You need to be culturally responsive in order for it to be welcoming. People will not come if they don't feel welcome. People they not, will not come if they, they feel that they actually will be heard, right? It's especially in, that, in, that, in, in those kind of, uh, these kind of settings. So yes, please do, um, and being creative is great. You, 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 are, you, are, calling it, you are calling it what, the, the, the NPA leading show? Oh, road show. Road show, <laughs> so meaning that you, you, you'll be Take in several. Road. Okay, taking it on the road, very good, because yes, unemployment of those schedules are definitely a huge issue. Um, as you know, uh, depending on where, where you work, what is your uh, occupation, you might work at night, you might work, you, might work, you might work in the morning, you might work in the afternoon, you might have children, you cannot leave them, there's childcare, there is transportation, there is scheduling, there is employment, there is all this uh, set of um, uh, things that needs to be taken into consideration. It doesn't say that um, it cannot be done, it's just working on it to make it happen. Because actually, I think that this is something that we all are, as community member, um, uh, I hope willing to do. We are not all here. This is what I'm saying. <laughs> we are not all here. And there is a lot of other people that would love to come if they were invited, if it was welcoming, if the understanding of the necessity and the, and the, the, the really importance of these type of forums is understood. So, Go ahead. Well, I'm just going to follow up on that, and it would be helpful to us if you could talk to your members, or if you could help us figure out how to make it more welcoming and what accommodations might be useful. Mm -hmm. You know, a different space, a different time, a different setting. I mean, is Sunday at five better than Wednesday at seven? Is meeting at Northgate more inviting than the Miller Center. I mean, any thoughts you have on that? I think I don't want to speak for uh, the steering committee would yeah, probably no. appreciate because <laughs> it's yeah. it's hard to second guess what would be right. helpful. The, the the first thing that I will actually uh, uh, give you that you know you, you might be thinking about it is information. Yeah. How, uh, how, do, how do you actually spread the, yeah. these very important topics that most of even us understand? Right? They're complicated enough. For us, and you know, English is our second language, you can tell me by my accent, but, and I don't understand, uh, you know, some of these uh, systems and some of these, uh, you know, linguals, and you know, uh, I, I, I need some explanation, but I have the opportunity to be able to ask them. You know, I can call Sarah and then say, hey Sarah, what, what's that you're supposed to mean? And then, you know, because we are, we, are, we are fortunate enough to be in a place where we, I think are welcoming enough, we are accessible enough for people to come to us. But the thing is, is that they need to have the information in order to do so. So, you know, the, the information sharing 
needs to be, in a way, accessible to all. Um, and, you know, the city has done, a, you know, a great job through, through the pandemic, so it does work, right? It does work. Um, but moving forward, with, because you, you can say, yes, city business is huge, but, you know, what seven, you know, it's, it's, it's just us. So how do we communicate? So that's that seems to be, for example, by 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 uh, by words. Why not? You know. I'm glad you're bringing this up. We actually um, a couple months ago we had an all words meeting, and uh, one of the topics we talked about was language access. Um, and luckily, there is someone on CETO who has um, experience working with language access and is very passionate about it. So this is something we're working on behind the scenes. Um, you know, whether that's using translated recordings of meetings, mm -hmm. translated agendas, a citywide translated mailer of what um, the MPA is. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited because it sounds like um, we, we, have a, we have someone who has experience and is passionate about language access. So I think yes, we're, we were we're all the city of Burlington language access plan. I've been at it, and we, we made our recommendations. Um, uh, and uh, if, if if there is a, a will, um, you know, that's that's what it starts with. So more than we were, we are more than happy to to, to connect and make it possible. This is really interesting, Sandrine, and I have to sort of step back and think of what it's like to leave your home and relocate to another world. And something that you just said kind of struck a chord, we're Ward 7 and Ward 4, but it reduces it from the United States, from Vermont, from Chittenden County, from this big city to just a neighborhood. And, you know, it's a start. It's community. And it yes. is community, and yes. you know, the whole city is community. Oh, yes. But by continuously Louder. reducing, 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 it might make it more comfortable. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've been doing recently is sort of stepping outside my comfort zone to do something I wouldn't normally do, don't want to do, and not comfortable to do. Mm -hmm. And most people don't like to do that. I hate it. But when I do it, I find I love it. So I'm just thinking, how can we as a tiny little community do something to reach out and bring it a little bit closer, whether that's a meeting or, you know, it, it, that's, just it, ideas, but that, just to start a conversation. Yeah, that, that's it. Not being comfortable, there, is a lot, there are a lot of people that would not, and, uh, and that's okay, but at, at, at least the, the least that we could do is to reach out, is to connect, is to communicate. Uh, it's a choice, and it's okay. You need to be able to, uh, you know, respect everybody's choice. Um, but, but, but that initiative that, um, and that, that was that's what it was said. It, you know, we are a small community, but it starts it starts with one and two. Right. So we can start to what seven, what four, and then all of a sudden it's everywhere, right? Let's let's start local, and then let let's uh, let's make it happen. <laughs> Sleep it over here. Thank you, Sandrine. Um, Thank you. Um, you have, um, as a leader, um, have you thought, of, or maybe you have, of knowing where your stakeholders, your members, your colleagues, in which wards do they live? Are they predominantly in ward one, two, three, four, five, um, or are your families scattered throughout the Burlington community. There's a reason why I ask it, but before I, I, and we can have another conversation about it, but do you know, have you plotted where your member, which wards um, they represent? The data, and I do believe the city must have the data on who is um, New Americans or foreign born. Um, but the thing is that and they are everywhere. And the number doesn't matter. 
Number does not matter. Well, politically they do. So. Uh, yes, politically, <laughs> of course. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, uh, Budget. They matter. And then as, uh, you know, uh, officials and political um, This is what I would say. So I've been in Ward 7 since 2006. Do you know how many officials that I came to my door? I don't live far, actually, I live just right there. Two. And I voted every single time, right? But I know they came to me and talked to two, two people. And Ali actually is, doesn't live far from me, <laughs> far from media, but I see him all the time. So it doesn't, it doesn't really call the alley, but to say, Sarah, I met, I met her at most meetings, uh, specifically before, uh, before COVID. But besides that, even during election time, campaign time, two, 2006, what is that? I, I, I do not understand. Right? So, yes, it's good to, to say we will, but I do believe that if you want somebody's vote, you need to show up and you need to communicate. Not to only the people that you know, but to everyone, even the one that you do not actually know. And VINAC is right here to be able to accommodate that. We want that communication to start up. We want that understanding, we want that relationship to be built. Because if not, no voice, and like you said, no power, right? Because we want to have our officials being accountable for what they say they would do. And they don't do for every, every single one of us. So, yes, I, 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 I do. Did I answer, did I answer your question? Thank you. Do you yes, all Monica. have meetings similar to this? Pardon? Do you all have meetings similar to this? Uh, no. Similar to this meeting? Mean? I mean, we, we do meet. We have community meetings. Right? Would, would it but be beneficial for other NPAs to come present to your um, team and say, you know, how would we integrate and participate together more? Or even better, so rather can than. I, can, I, can I answer that? <laughs> Ali, go ahead. Please, thank you. Uh, <laughs> yes, I think uh, there are several questions, and I think um, the NPA does not go to any organization to present that. NPA is actually invite organization, just like what this NPA did to invite Sunday. I think that's something. And I think there is also a question about where do your members live. BNAC is a statewide organization. We have members in Winooski, Shelburne, Ward 8, Ward 4, Ward 7, uh, Winooski, all Yes. Yes. They are here, right here. Not yes. Exactly. Yes. And I think, you know, what to do, I think, um, in terms of, you know, uh, bringing more diversity, and I think the one thing to start is for people to consider stop scrutinizing people of color all over the place. I am a candidate. I've been a candidate. But there has not been anybody from this steering committee that did not run against me. What I'm saying is true, right? These are the people. Uh, uh, we have also another candidate who was a school commissioner. Has people even bothered to really start to understand why he stepped out after one, one, one run? He, he did step out. I think sometimes spaces that we create, and we're talking about diversity, we have to be genuinely there Welcome. in order to invite people and also to, 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 to bring them part of the process. Just wanted to add that. But we also have done so much work with the state of Vermont, such as the Office of professional regulation. We consulted with even this ballot item about you know non-citizen voting. We are representing you know circles about youth mental health, you know, the National Guard, so on and so forth. We do so much work because people 
value our services, they come to us, and then we provide some type of consulting without any money, right? We want, we are part of this community. We just need to be acknowledged and appreciated because our participation do matter. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Ali. Thank you. Jeff. Jeff. Um, thank you, Sandrine. It was great to learn about your organization. And I know you, you mentioned you're a small group. Mm -hmm. I, I'm supposing a small group of leaders but you're probably open to other new American cultures. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, do you recruit like Bhutan, there's a lot of Bhutanese Nepali yes. in our community. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if you actively recruit others. Mm -hmm. And then my other question is, um, like on vo when we have voting, you've talked about voting and civic engagement. Um, do you, does your group go to Franklin Square or Riverside Avenue um, to talk to these people and, and encourage them to vote, or just that they know that they can vote if they're citizens, and maybe if this if non-citizen thing passes, more of them yes. will be able to vote. Um, I know myself and a fellow school commissioner went to Franklin Square and knocked on everyone's doors and mm -hmm. just for the high school vote. So, and we were well receptive there. So. Those are just some questions. So, 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 um, okay. So, yes, recruiting is something that we are planning on actively doing. Um, and when it comes to the process in which we get in contact with the community members, it varies. The Bhutanese community, the Nepalese community, yes, we are in, we, we are in contact with, like I said, the, 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 the communities that we have been working uh, with, uh, Bhutanese, Nepalese, Somalian, um, uh, Somali Bantu, uh, Sudanese, all these community um, have different cultures. That, that's the thing. You go to France and Quay, right? You knock on somebody's door, what do you say? They don't speak English, you turn around, you go, right? That's why. It is community-based information that is being made, right? Um, there is a cultural understanding of what voting means, or how you vote, or who you vote for, or what it actually, whatever is on the ballot, what it means to you. What are the consequences of saying yes and the consequences of saying no? We are not in the business of telling them how to vote. We don't want to tell them how to vote. We do not do that. That's why it is very important for them to understand the choice they make. And that knocking on the door and saying, yes, during the campaign, I would love to have all those uh, uh, what candidates go in and knock on people's door and, and do just that. But when it comes to our, our um, work and our message, um, it is done in a way that is culturally responsive. Zillion of ways to do that. And for to be able actually to make your message um, pass through somebody's understanding of what it is, they need to trust you. This is what the thing is. It's not just to say, and then, but they need to trust the process. They need to trust what you are trying to educate them about. And for them to make their choice. So that's why funding is very important. That's why capacity is very important. That's why time is very important. This is not something that would be done just tomorrow, next day. There is not one click solution on this. Community building, as you know, is very, uh, a very complicated process, a very hard process. Uh, you need commitment. Um, and there will not be Vina coming and all of a sudden all the, you know, they, oh, yeah, sure, but no. This is something that we have to do together as a community. It is a process, a journey. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm <clears throat> still thinking about the, mm -hmm. the process of civic engagement. And yes. from, <clears throat> from your perspective, where are the points of intersection? Where, where do those points of intersection 
need to be with like with your steering your your leadership mm -hmm. council mm -hmm. or uh, at your membership meetings or you know so so if we're trying to if people are trying to sort of expand awareness and engagement I, I'm trying to get at what what do you think are those specific times and places where those intersections need to happen does does that question make sense to you no uh, it's not really clear I think it's where where are the opportunities that um, uh, NPAs can oh uh, meet and speak and listen well, to your members yeah I mean for for us specifically yeah. I, I guess as, yeah. as NPA yeah does does you know, but that's one example, but the concept would go beyond that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the, does our M NPA team need to talk to your leadership team, or does the NPA team need to come and meet with, you, you know, when you have a, a membership community meeting? Mm -hmm. D does that idea make sense about you know, in terms where does the interaction and the messaging... How do we communicate? Yeah. How do we communicate with you mm -hmm. when we don't know your language, mm -hmm. you don't know ours, and like you said, we knock on the door, mm -hmm. and they start speaking in your language. What are we to do? Normally, you run jail and run. What, what option do we have mm -hmm. in suggestion to create your forum in a forum with an interpreter, with people presenting the facts. Here's where it gets touchy. We need people to give the facts and the truth of an agenda mm -hmm. or an opponent, not their individual agenda or party move. Right. This is a problem that's not just cultural. This is a problem everywhere. But in Ward 4 and 7, we can put a handle on that and then migrate it to others, and then it'll take off statewide. Because <coughs> adding doesn't go fast enough, but multiplication does. Teach five, send them out, they get five more. Send them out. All of a sudden you get the popcorn effect. Everybody's communicating. We have interpreters, people that'll step up and go, okay, I can speak uh, your language invite me in and we'll talk. Yes, uh, but recruiting within is what, what I think will make it more um, impactful because yes, you, you are right when it comes to the interpretation of the language or the understanding of, and the agenda. Um, you know, the, depending on who does it, who, <laughs> that's true, uh, and who is invited and, and, and so, so on and so forth. But I, I do believe that you know we, we all talk about diversity, um, uh, equity, and inclusion, right? Uh, we have a we have a we have a, an office, right? In the city of Burlington, <laughs> right? Uh, and uh, what do you see? Because it it it, it starts by seeing. You need to see and you need to reflect the community. But what do you see? Right? What what, what coming? It's the words are good. You know, you can say what it, you can say it in every single language. It's, it's everywhere. Every single language on the earth. But if you don't belong, if you don't feel that sense of belonging, what do I do? You need to reflect the community. How do you attract that? Because it's not only you going, they need to come. So how do you attract them, right? You need to look like attracting me with them. Diversity is exactly it, right? So, first and first stop, yes, you can come, Jack. You come to our, our one of our meetings and you start talking about the, you know, the, the whole aspect of the NPA, on good it is, on great it is, and how you can do this, how you can do that. And yeah, somebody comes, they want two or three. Will they find themselves here? Welcoming. There is a two sets. It's in and out. Working within, working 
out. That's, that's, what, that's, that's why they work. It's, it's just not one set of things. There are several things that could be done. Several things. It doesn't have to be right now, every single, I don't know, no. But that's what planning is. That's what strategy is. It starts with a movement of a will of <coughs> seeing change, right? So, yes, let's discuss that further. Willing to do it. A couple things you said that have really stuck with me, um, and you just touched on them, is uh, people need to feel welcome to come, and uh, people need to like trust you to also want to participate. And I, that's so relatable because I think so many of us belong to groups that may not be welcome everywhere. And as you were talking about that, I, I can picture there have definitely been spaces that I've wanted to participate in and without even really being there, can kind of see some obstacles and like, mm, don't really feel welcome there already. Is there, is there, and I know this is obviously, like you said, there's a lot of components. I'm trying to think, is there something about this setup, how we put out notices that is Unwelcoming? Is there is there like is there something that you can point to about the MPA that may be upfront unwelcoming to um, uh, new Americans? Hmm. Frankly, okay. I, mean, I, I, I can I can jump in. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think, I think we again thank you so much for this genuine and, and wonderful question, and I think this is what exactly what is missing mm. about the NPAs in general. And this, I'm just saying from my from my experience, this is not about teaching new Americans. Like someone commented about, okay, how do we teach you? And if I teach you, you teach others multiplication, it's not about that. But it is more about embracing the difference. If you are a male, black, gray hair, whatever you are, you have this sense of power. You don't even think about the other, their experiences, their lived experiences, whether they gay, lesbian, transgender, whatever they are. I think starting with that, and just understanding there is the other person. This is not me. This is not my lived experiences. And how do I embrace that person? And provide the platform where they can come and feel that this is my space. I can evolve in this space. I think the NPAs need to start with that. The way that they need to do it, it's very simple. Among your neighbors, your neighborhood, identify if there is someone who's not like you and invite, generally invite them to come, to come here, right? And then if they come, uh, they come back again, invite them to be a member of the steering committee. So that's what we do not do in this city, in these NPAs, in many different type of things. We do not. Someone has to step up, and that's what BNAC is actually doing, to, to change the narrative, to just say, hey, there are other people that are not like you and me that are here. You have to be genuine. That genuine, genuinity is key to what we're trying to achieve here. Build relationships in your work, in your neighborhood, your comfort zone. Try to build relationship with the people. That's it. And from there, the relationship people will start to trust you. You invite them in places they will show up. I personally do not think, right, um, that there was an opportunity here that we let go, which is uh, the neighborhood, uh, the dinner, the dinner that we used to have before the NPS, that needs to come back. If that comes back, let's be genuine and just say today is Nepali dish that we're doing here in this community. The Nepali people will show up. Because it's about them, it's about their culture, it's about their food. They would be here, and at least you will retain one or two that will continue to come and taste Congolese, and taste American, and taste all the things. To your question, I think it's, it's really genuine, and, and thank you for asking. Thanks for the feedback. 
So to add to this wonderful, thank you, Ali. Uh, you said a lot of the things that I, uh, I wanted to say, yes. Um, um, you know, every single meeting or forum or platform that has been a business in this, uh, serious business in, uh, tend to be cool, right? How do you work this out? After COVID, this is, you know, in-person meeting, you are transitioning into it, very good. How do you transition into it? The same way you did before COVID? Is it the same? Is it the same way? Or did you change anything? It's different. How do you plan? It's different? There's Zoom now as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But just the, the way we're sitting around this table, it's different. Yeah, it's different, yeah, yeah. So, you know, they had a dinner. You had a dinner. I didn't even know they yes. had a dinner. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I would have come. That was good. That was, that was building community. This is what, this is what NPA is supposed to, to start with, building community. And there is things that you don't have to invent to build community. You already know you have done that. Start with just going back to what you know best, what, have, what has been successful. And then add a notch to it. It's, it's a human-human connection, right? COVID killed us. It, it killed us with, with this, with the Zoom thing. <laughs> yeah. Right? So transitioning to that, to, to bring people up, bring people back to that. And yes, one-on-one, one-on-one commitment. Acceptance is all there is. Without acceptance, there is nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A lot to, uh, to, to talk about at our next uh, meeting. <laughs> I think it's also not about four or five members of steering committee inviting right. someone. It's, you know, the whole community. But it's up with one. One person has to invite someone. It's up with one. Whoever they are, it doesn't matter. It's up with one. But it's just reaching out, being human. Correct. The human connection is up with that. Really bringing down to community building. Like, yeah, down to like a person to person level. And I think NPAs are a really great way to, to demonstrate the power of community building. It's, I mean, just this conversation. I've learned so much on making my notes and underlining and circling, and I, this, this has been really great. We have been talking about uh, diversity, uh, equity, inclusion, and you know, racial equity, and you know, justice here, justice there. Um, it's good to talk about it. It's really hard to start it. Um, this is a really good occasion to, 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 do, to do it. Uh, COVID actually, give us that opportunity to start something new. Thank so you. let's do it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. We will talk to you again. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hope so. <laughs> everybody for participating in that conversation. Um, our next speaker is Derek with Burlington Electric Department. Oh, and Jen. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks for having Not us. Not to leave Thanks. you out of the conversation. <laughs> well, I will kick us off and Darren will do the meat of our sort of presentation before we get to, to questions. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll let you do your own formal introductions. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, I'm Jennifer Green, and I'm at the I'm the director of sustainability for the city, and I'm housed uh, in Darren's shop at the Burlington Electric Department. Um, and I have Darren here with me tonight. Darren's going to um, walk us through some potential uh, building electrification policies that we're thinking about. But before that, I want to frame it up for you all so that we're all sort of starting from a the same um, same you know place and space. So you all remember that in 2014, Burlington became the first city in the country to source our electricity from renewables. So that was very exciting. And upon that accomplishment, decided to take it to the next level 
which uh, was to transition to net zero energy. So essentially move away from fossil fuels in the built environment and the transportation sector. So um, along with this and to help in that process, Burlington Electric is fortunate to have uh, an office uh, or energy efficiency team that provides technical support. We have um, rebates and incentives uh, to help people with building electrification heat pumps, for example, um, electric vehicles. We partner with CarShare to help them with their fleet electrification. So lots going on. But uh, the city council came to us and said, no, we've got to do, think about policy as well. And so um, per the city council's request, we are going back to them with some ideas that um, we've been formulating with some of our stakeholders. And it's now an okay time to kick it over to you, Darren? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Darren Spurrier, general manager with Burlington Electric, Ward 7 resident. Um, glad to be here. This is our uh, second to last MPA meeting in our road show uh, that we're doing. Um, and we've got Ward 6 tomorrow night, and then we'll be at the city council um, next Monday on the 5th uh, to talk about the uh, the outcome of some of the work that we've been doing. And um, for folks who remember the town meeting day vote uh, 2021, we had a vote on this question of whether the city should have a charter change related to uh, regulating emissions in buildings. It passed with about 65% of the vote. Um, then the legislature considered it earlier this year and passed it, the governor signed it. And uh, in May, the resolution Jen mentioned was passed by the council asking us and the Department of Permitting and Inspections to look at uh, new construction, look at large existing buildings, look at city buildings, uh, major innovations, and come up with some ideas. Uh, we in, had an interim report in July that's uh, available. That's, I think it's up on our website. Um, we can share a link if that's helpful uh, to share with the MPA. And um, we've done work including a couple of different stakeholder meetings with uh, folks who develop projects in the community, uh, design community, the energy efficiency, uh, community and uh, large building uh, owners like UVM, UVM Medical Center, the Champlain College, the school district, the city itself. And um, we've also worked with a group called the Building Electrification Institute, which is a national uh, group that works with cities uh, examining these policies. And all of what we're doing is in service of trying to find ways to cost effectively and practically reduce emissions in buildings. And so where we've kind of uh, I think started to land in terms of our recommendations are a couple of different things. Uh, the first would be for new construction. Uh, we currently have uh, passed in 2021 a requirement that new buildings have to use a renewable heating system. Um, and actually South Burlington just passed uh, a very, very similar requirement based on Burlington's requirement uh, just happened. So uh, the work here in Burlington actually spurred some additional interest in South Burlington, which is great. Um, what we're going to look at recommending for new construction is potentially going beyond just the heating system and saying that for other thermal uses in the building, uh, things like water heating or cooking, um, appliances, that those should be renewable too um, if this was to be enacted. And uh, there's a lot of different ways we define renewable in the ordinances in Burlington. Uh, it can be electricity because we are 100% renewable with electricity, so we have heat pumps and other technologies that work. Uh, can be with a renewable fuel uh, in a conventional heating system or, or appliance. Um, things like renewable gas, uh, biodiesel, other types of renewable fuels, they all count in Burlington's ordinance. Uh, wood heating counts, for example. So there's a lot of different ways that something can be renewable. But we're, we're looking at proposing having all of new construction, uh, or, or the majority of it, be uh, renewable if this was to happen starting in 2024. And also to offer that, and this is part of the charter change that was enacted, if a building can't meet a portion of that requirement, you could have a carbon impact fee, just like you would have a development fee, uh, impact fee that can happen. And that would look at the carbon emissions from the system that's in question over its lifetime and use a rate of discount and have it be a one-time fee right at the part of uh, permit, part of the permit process. And so the idea there would be to level the playing field more for renewable technologies relative to fossil fuel technologies for new construction. The other piece of what we're looking at is in large existing buildings, which we're really thinking about 50,000 square feet and larger, I think there's maybe 80 buildings in the city that would fit that characterization. Uh, they would maybe have a similar requirement for heating systems and water heating systems. Uh, if you go to pull a permit, uh, after 2024, you should use a renewable technology or renewable fuel, um, or you could pay the alternative compliance fee. 
And one of the things would be a new thing for the city if this was to happen. And I should mention that if we if we propose and the city council decides to put this on the ballot, uh, it would require another town meeting day vote to authorize it. Uh, so uh, voters would get a chance to weigh in, uh, I think in March, on this question. Um, what would the fee revenue uh, proceeds go to? And a couple of the ideas that we would propose is one, uh, to help the city uh, in its own efforts to move towards a electric uh, fleet of vehicles. Um, so some capital support for that. Uh, and in addition, there was an advisory ballot question, uh, question seven, uh, in 2021 that also passed that said that the benefits of this transition should also go to lower income residents in Burlington. So we would propose that there also be a new fund within the city that could support clean heating technologies for lower income residents, uh, renters, lower income homes, and et cetera. And then uh, lastly, there could be an opportunity for the existing buildings that pay into this uh, to have a portion of the fee be available back to them uh, to do emissions reduction projects on their, in their facility. Because uh, a lot of, as I mentioned, a lot of the large existing buildings are really part of a campus in some cases. They might be a school, a university, uh, the city itself, uh, et cetera. And so having the opportunity, if you had to pay into uh, the fee, to be able to get a portion back if you wanted to do something else on your campus that would reduce emissions uh, could be an idea as well. So those are the ideas that we've had that we've been vetting uh, with stakeholders and sharing with folks at MPAs and taking feedback on. And uh, we'd love to hear if you have questions or, or thoughts for us on that, or uh, just we like visiting the MPAs in general. And so sometimes folks have questions about uh, either our, our climate work in the city or Burlington Electric's work in the city. We're happy to answer those uh, too. And, and want to thank you for having us uh, here with you tonight. I'll kick off the questions if I could. Um, I actually have two questions. Um, in your description, were you talking about commer uh, not commercial, but public and commercial buildings and not privately owned residences? Yes, thank you for that question, because uh, that's, that's something that's come up a lot. Uh, nothing we are proposing uh, would affect existing residential uh, or small business uh, buildings. Uh, we're really only for the existing buildings looking at uh, above 50,000 square feet, and we would not propose uh, residential, even large multi-unit buildings. We're not uh, proposing policy related to that. And my second question is, um, so we don't have solar panels on our house in Ward 4. Uh -huh. We're contemplating it. We've had two different messages from, not your department, from the solar panel installers. Okay. What we would like to do, and probably a lot of our neighbors would like to do, is in your program, is pay for panels on the roof, mm -hmm. generate the electricity for our home and our car, mm -hmm. and then give it back to the grid. Yep and then somehow get a price break on, on the bill, on a bill. Yep. Uh, we've had very conflicting um, explanations of that. <coughs> I'm sure you've contemplated this. Yes, and I, I have that exact setup at my house too. Um, so I think what you're referring to, we call net metering uh, right. with solar. And there's a program, it's a state program uh, that we, we have in Burlington as well. And it basically says that if you put solar on your roof, um, you're gonna get uh, credit for the kilowatt hours that you're using at your house that you're not pulling in from the grid. Um, and you're also able, when you have extra, to send it to the grid and be paid for that as well. So if you're a net metering customer on your bill, there will be uh, kind of a different presentation than what you have now. And it'll show your solar credit and how many kilowatt hours you used, how many kilowatt hours you sent back to the grid. And if you are an electric vehicle customer, we also have a special rate uh, for residential customers if you want to charge off peak. And in that case, you can also get a bill credit uh, for being able to charge off peak because that helps us save uh, for all customers. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the setup. Now, some solar companies do a lease as opposed to if you finance and own the panels yourself, and those can be differently structured. So uh, it's worth exploring whether you want to lease the panels um, or whether you want to own them and finance them. And uh, there's a number of good credit union loan programs for that as well. I wonder if it's worth mentioning, Darren, just about the technical support that we can offer. So if you were to call BED, we would put you in touch with someone that could help you, as a trusted advisor, walk through your the proposals that you have and maybe help you make a more informed decision. Thank you very much. Yeah. Just in that vein, I, I think we should make that more known. And I have people call me about the conflicts. Sometimes there's conflicts actually in the building code requirements and they don't know who to turn to. So I just think that's something 
we can make more well known to people because I think it is confusing. No, absolutely. Um, Darren, if I may quickly, um, I thought I remember some conversation in the legislature last year uh, about capping sort of the, the number of net metering uh, capacity statewide. Does, um, I don't know where that conversation ended up and, and would that impact uh, Burlington? Yeah, so um, this actually goes back. I was, I was Deputy Commissioner of the Public Service Department uh, back in 2013 to 2015, and we had this issue back then where net metering as a state program would hit a cap and we would, it would be shut off, essentially. So it used to be that it was 2% of the statewide utility uh, peak, and then it, in 2012, I think it was, got bumped up to 4%. And I worked on a bill back in 2014 where we moved it from 4% to 15% and then ultimately no cap. And uh, that's where it is uh, right now is that there is no cap on utilities uh, being able to accept net metering or being required really to accept net metering. Uh, there is a discussion on the pricing. Um, so the price was a lot higher uh, several years back to try to support solar, to try to support the industry getting going. Um, the price for panels have come down, so the price that the PUC, the Public Utility Commission, allows has also come down. Uh, so there is a lot of discussion around that, and, and obviously some solar developers would like to see the price higher. Uh, utilities that may be paying uh, for the net metering might like to see the price lower in some cases. So there's some discussion around that. Um, but as of right now, there's no cap um, for customers. There are caps for individual projects. Um, so if you are uh, you know, um, a large customer and you wanted to do solar, you're capped usually at 500 kilowatts for that project, um, which I think everybody here would be able to get everything they want on their home or small business, but, uh, you know, 500 uh, would be more like, almost like an acre of, or, or more of solar. Uh, Why are there caps at all? Oh, good question. Yeah, so, well, net metering um, is really intended, I think, if you look at it, like, over the course of the country, it's really intended to be exactly what you were just describing. Like I put solar panels on my house, I'm generating some of my own electricity, I'm sending some back to the grid. What we've done in Vermont, you know, to support the development of solar was we said, you can have virtual net metering. We can put a 500 kilowatt project out somewhere and everybody here can kind of have a slice of it and it's basically at above market rate. But, but it's being put on the grid and then people are taking the energy off. Right. But it's, it's basically the highest cost renewable that you can get. Um, that, so your solar panel is the highest cost renewable? Net meter uh, solar is the highest cost solar that you can get. Like if you were to go, if, if you were saying to us. Or we're talking about the rate, the rate that the homeowner or whoever would be paid by the correct. utility. Correct. Is from, the, from the procurement side of things, if you were to tell us at Burlington Electric, Go get solar and do it as cheaply as you can. Right. You know, we might be able to get it for eight cents or ten cents a kilowatt hour. And with net metering, we're paying sometimes 17, 18 cents a kilowatt hour. Why not just look, just pay, you know, pay the rate that you would be paying anyway and let the, you know, whether if they can get their solar economically or not, that's right. kind of a, a market decision for that homeowner or for that business that's, to have. That's an interesting proposal. And and and, and you know, they'll why even have two meters, one for incoming power and the other for outgoing right. power? Why not just pay the same rate that we're paying you right. when we take the energy off of the grid? We would be interested to talk about that. It's a statewide policy, so it's not a rate decision that we get to make individually. Right. But what you're talking about is maybe a way forward I, for the program. I mean, how would you even know? Because I, I mean, I know how an electric meter works. I, I, right. I'm an electrical engineer myself. Right. And um, if I were to put solar panels on my house and then right. sometime of the month I'm putting energy back in yep. that meter is going to run backwards that's correct and it's going to run backwards at the same rate per per watt as it would be running forward that's if right that, if what, I was taking that many watts from what the state program says is that you have to have a second meter that so meters I, the solar. I would be illegal if I was not no not illegal you would just have a different setup but it wouldn't be as advantageous to you financially well I mean I wouldn't expect to get paid more per kilowatt hour supplying the juice than I would be taking it. I would, I would expect the it the other way around. That's, that's what it is. And that's why oh. it's like, that's so why we're paid more, we're paid a, 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 a subsidized increased value Correct. for putting energy onto the grid Correct. than what we're paying for taking it off. Correct, you got it. 
Right. Now you understand the dilemma. No, that, that to me seems very odd. And that's, that's part of the discussion at this stage. I thought it was the other way around. I thought that you guys had two, two, um, two rates so that the, when we were putting energy on the grid, we weren't yeah. getting paid the same amount that uh, we were being charged. No, I so thought the, we were being paid le less yeah, than more. The way it's worked typically is that at least for the first 10 years of the system's life, there's a credit or adder that is, that is accounted for for every kilowatt hour you generate, whether you use it on site or not, and it's above market. It, 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 it seems to me it should just be the same meter. But well, you might want to come to the legislature. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'll be a discussed topic, uh, you know, this session. I mean, and like you wouldn't even have to upgrade the meter. You right. Know, that's the more very traditional version of that meter. Okay, that's right. The microphone is over here. Now. All right. Hi, um, and thanks for. Uh, and talking to us about this tonight. Um, I'm a big supporter of the electric, electrification and I do support smart policy to do so. And I'm just wondering if any of the uh, communities around Burlington have anything analogous to what we're thinking about doing. Because one of the things that um, is always a lens that I apply to a lot of uh, policy in Burlington is, are we keeping Burlington competitive regionally? And um, it, it, it's always a concern of mine when we start to drive development um, away from Burlington because of policies we have here. Right. So you could just elaborate on that a little bit. No, it's a, it's a good question. I think what South Burlington just did actually went a little further than what we have currently. Um, so we, I think 2021, we had a renewable heating ordinance. And what they've passed now is a renewable heating and a renewable water heating uh, program for new construction. And so what we would be doing here uh, would be we'd be catching back up I think to South Burlington uh, and maybe going a little further in certain respects with new construction I think with the existing buildings with the large existing buildings we'd be doing something a little bit novel um, but we'd be essentially asking them in their capital planning to assume that if you're going to pull a permit you should have a renewable system uh, we've engaged pretty uh, constructively and, and uh, heavily with a lot of the stakeholders who would be in that category um, we've had uh, two stakeholder meetings at um, the Department of Permitting and Inspections with uh, folks from Main Street Landing and Burton and the hospital and UVM and the school district and others. Um, and uh, we've been able to share kind of ideas back and forth and make sure that what we'd be proposing would be something that would be uh, constructive and something that in a lot of cases they have their own initiatives to try to move in this direction, something that would be supporting uh, their progress in that way. So I won't say it will necessarily be universally endorsed uh, by every stakeholder, uh, but we've tried to really get to a practical point uh, for existing buildings. And with new construction at least, it seems like South Burlington and Burlington are moving in the same direction and it's possible other communities might be uh, inspired to do the same. I'm online. I don't need a mic, but I have a question. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Um, thank you, um, Darren, for being here and team. Um, and was just wondering if you can speak a little bit about how the rebates are going in general from last year compared to last year and this year. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, in terms of rebates, we've had really strong uptake on uh, heat pumps. We continue to have a lot of customers who are interested in heat pumps. Uh, we've had very strong interest in our electric lawnmower program. Um, that continues to be uh, very, very uh, popular. I think it's our second largest program now. Um, and then electric vehicles is the third largest. And I think what we saw with the electric vehicles is that the supply chain disruptions uh, really had an impact. Uh, you know, we had. Not a lot of used electric vehicles available, not a lot of new electric vehicles available. The price was going up and up and up over the last uh, year or so because of inflation and other factors. So we didn't see as many customers uh, switch to electric vehicles during that period of time. Um, but on the other hand, these other programs like the lawnmowers and the heat pumps, where there hasn't been the, the disruption, we've seen really strong progress. And uh, as you know, Councillor Jing, we'll probably have some new programs to announce uh, in January. Every year we try to uh, add some new incentives uh, and rebates. Um, so we're looking at ways that we can support customers uh, with some of those new programs as well. But I um, uh, appreciate the question, and we will have a, a net zero update for the Council probably in the April time frame as well to give you some more data. You know, it strikes me that um, Thank you. from our first panel, from a your family or one of our community members uh, doesn't know about a re 
rebate program for an electrical lawnmower, then that's exactly the kind of example of information sharing that is useful to you and it's useful to, well, it's useful to all of us. So I didn't know about electric lawnmowers, frankly. So there we are. Yes, um, I could talk about electric lawnmowers all day, but I probably it'd be a good time to mention our work uh, and our, our kind of growing work on equity too. Yeah, um, yeah, we're really committed to ensuring that all our customers, regardless of where they're from, what they speak at home, where they go to school, whether they rent or homeowners, have access to this transition away from fossil fuels. So we really think a lot about that, and so. In a case where someone might not be in a position to buy an electric vehicle, this is where we look to our friends at CarShare and say, how can we help you CarShare in making sure that your vehicles are placed in areas that are most accessible to folks and that the rates are um, accessible. So I, Annie does have a, a, it's free to join uh, based on your income level. We're also helping Annie with her electrification, the electrification of her fleet. So we feel like this is a way for people to taste electric and be involved in sort of the electric transportation revolution without having to own a vehicle. But you're right, I mean, <clears throat> similarly, this is why sometimes policy is really important. So if you're a renter and you can't control sort of any of the inputs in your property because you don't own that property, this is where we think our weatherization policy is especially meaningful. So this was passed last year and essentially it says that if you're a property owner, a multi-unit dwelling property owner, and your building uses more than 50,000 BTUs, British Thermal Units, which is how we measure sort of natural gas, you've got to drop that load. And so we're really fortunate to be working with the Department of Planning and Inspections to make that policy sort of come to fruition. So it's, it's happening now, and buildings that are the most egregious BTU users are on the docket now to come into compliance. Over the next four years, do, 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 we'll be working down to that 50,000 mark. So totally agree with you, and um, I, I'm really excited about some of the exciting staffing additions that we're going to have at BED to help make sure we've got some really good connections with the new American community. I hope that you're not going to use those drug on BTU. Yes, <laughs> I know. I know. What is she saying? I know. I hear you loud and clear. I tell you. Yeah, the acronyms and the initials are out of control. Yeah. British thermal unit is a matchstick. It's basically right. if you lit a match, right? So it'd be 50,000 matchsticks You're right. there you worth go. of energy. But that's really good. good. That's really important. It is really, I mean, fundamental is how we communicate in the language that we, that we use. And, but I was, I was thinking during your presentation of a lot yeah, of the same things same. because we survey our customers. We just did a survey. Um, we do one every, every three years. And we, we learn a lot through that process. And we find out that people who participate in the efficiency programs that we have generally are very happy. But we also tend to find out that not enough people know about them. Uh, sometimes half of the community is not aware that we offer these programs. And uh, we also have a pretty high population of renters and students relative to other utilities in the state of Vermont. So even if we do a great job of telling everybody about our programs, three years later it may not be the same folks who are living in the same property. And so we have to keep communicating in all different kinds of ways and get the message out. And uh, yeah, I'm surprised I walked around my neighborhood uh, here in the New North End and I have a neighbor who got an electric uh, leaf blower and didn't know we had a rebate. And I feel like I talk about this stuff all the time. <laughs> I didn't know. Uh, so we, we always have to do more. I have an electrical leaf blower. I didn't even know. Yes. I didn't even know. Yes, we've got to do we've got to do more to get the word out about yeah, these thank programs. You. Thank you. Yeah. I have an electric toaster of it. Can I get a rebate? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we don't have that. I have a question for you uh, from online. Um, Bob Hooper, you got your hand there? I do have my hand. Well, I have three actually now. Knock uh, it down to two. Uh, Darren, thanks for coming. I was going to. You threw in leaf blower, and you know, in the spirit of the season, uh, you also go to snow blowers and we do. other things that. Oh, really? We you, do. You're just a little. You're a little cautious to grab a hold of because you don't think they're going to be as good as the gasoline thing, and quite frankly, they are. Um, I'm wondering. Well, a, a comment and then a question. Uh, with Robert's uh, discussion about paying out the same pay in, uh, I assume that we're talking about a return on investment for the person that puts ten thousand dollars into the top of their house. Uh, that would sort of stifle that initiative, I guess. 
which is not something we want. Um, and then secondly, as a, as a greater uh, worm on the end of the hook, what do you pay for filling up your car at night under the, the residential rate that most people have? Good, good points and questions. Thank you, Representative Hooper. Uh, so we do have a snowblower rebate. I have an electric snowblower. I'm talking about those a lot too. Uh, we just got it. And the, I'll just say the great thing about the electric lawn equipment snowblowers is if you get the same brand, they all have a battery that's removable and you can use the different batteries in the different pieces of equipment. So you always have an extra battery. So I definitely encourage folks, if you're getting an electric snowblower, lawnmower, trimmer, leaf blower, try to get the same brand, whichever one you get, and then the batteries are all interchangeable. Um, in terms of the net metering discussion, uh, it's true that we did, I think, as a state, put more emphasis on incentives uh, for those rates to help people be able to invest in solar, have a reasonable payback. I think with the recent action at the federal level to put the tax credit back up to 30% and the cost of panels coming down, uh, there continues to be opportunity to, to sort of lower the uh, cost structure and still ensure that people are able to put uh, solar on their roof. and. That's a, that's a fine balance that we always have to get right. And we, we support solar. We have over nine megawatts of solar in the city of Burlington, and we are about a 65 megawatt peaking system. So in the summertime, when the hottest day is happening in the afternoon, we might be getting you know 13% or so of our electricity is coming from solar that's right here in the city of Burlington on that given day. Um, so it's an important resource. It's a good resource. Uh, to your last question, the great deal that we have, uh, especially was really good when prices were $5 a gallon, still good at $3 a gallon, is if you do have an electric vehicle and you are on our off-peak rate, you can charge up overnight for the equivalent of about $0.70 cents a gallon of gas, and you're getting 100% renewable electricity. Um, and when you spend a dollar with us, um, more than two-thirds of that dollar typically stays in the state of Vermont. If you spend a dollar at the gas station, about uh, three quarters of that dollar is leaving the state of Vermont because we don't have a whole lot of uh, supply chain when it comes to the oil industry, but the electric utilities are, tend to have more local spending. So it's a great buy local opportunity as well as a renewable and a cost saving opportunity. Um, can I go back, I have a question going back to the policy side of things. I was uh, very intrigued to hear you talk about the 50,000 square foot criteria. Um, I guess my underlying concern is the, the in, initial uh, charter change ordinance that passed that talked about you know, residential uh, you know, electrification um, was pretty open-ended in my understanding in terms of you know, how it applies. So, um, so for the, you know, the ordinary, I think Bridget asked this question, so for the old, ordinary homeowner kind of thing. Uh, so where's the, where are the policy guidelines going to be in place to sort of keep that limit from right. ever lowering and encroaching on ordinary homeowners? Is that a policy discussion that you talked about? Yeah, and in this context, what we really um, advocated for was a focus on new construction and on these larger uh, commercial buildings that really, when you think about it, they're, they're doing capital planning for 10, 15, 20 years. And if we put a policy in place and say Burlington wants you to plan for renewable, they can accommodate that within their long-term plan. Um, it's very different if you're uh, you know, a homeowner or if you're a small business and you don't have that kind of capital planning and you're, not, you're trying to keep things going until they break, um, and then you're going to be in a lot of cases in an emergency replacement situation. We think that uh, at the moment our incentive programs are the right way to try to reach those customers. We want to convince you to put in a heat pump uh, and help you with the cost of that or to put in a heat pump water heater or to do energy efficiency measures in your home or switch to an electric vehicle, uh, hopefully because it's saving uh, on, on your costs uh, or helping you with your costs, but also as a lot of folks are motivated by climate, a lot of people are motivated by renewables. Um, so we really want to be persuading uh, customers that this is a good opportunity. Uh, we're not looking at uh, residential, and you're right that the charter change does permit the city to look at that. Um, we think it'd be great to get a lot of experience with uh, the sectors that we're looking at now uh, before we would look at any sort of further uh, policy. Uh, so that, that's kind of the way we've, we've talked about it. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't mean something couldn't happen in the future, but you would also have a vote on that as well. 
Right. Uh, it's just me. Yeah, my, my reservation is that the enabling ordinance, if you will, is quite broad. Right. And we would just sort of be concerned about long term uh, mission creep, if you would. Right. No, I think it's important, just a quick point, is that um, there's some really great programs available right now uh, from the state and from the federal government from the spending that came through COVID. Uh, there's $20 million through the state legislature um, that is helping people who are income qualified to upgrade their electric panel. Because sometimes you can't put in a heat pump or an electric vehicle or a heat pump water heater if you don't have the right electric panel upgrades. So there's going to be programs to help with that for people who need help or income qualified programs to help switch to a heat pump water heater. So I think it's important, not only we get the message out about the lawnmower programs, the other programs, we need to get the message out about our uh, state <laughs> assistance and federal assistance too. Thank you, Thank you, Bert. Thank you. Yeah, can I, I think I'm right, I just wanna clarify something for Jeff. When we went for the charter change, the driver for the charter change was really um, this carbon offset fee, mm -hmm. which was not allowed within our charter. As I understand it, the city of Burlington yesterday and today can prescribe residential heating standards. Mm -hmm. So we never needed a charter change for that. Correct. What we really needed it for was this carbon offset. So um, it got a little bit confusing, but last year or five years from now, the city can set residential standards. And there's been no discussion, it really was always driven by commercial. Councilor Carpenter is exactly right. And there are residential building codes that apply uh, to, to residences and there will continue to be standards. But, uh, but we under, we're not pursuing any kind of carbon fee or anything else uh, relative to residential or small businesses at this point. So we are in our closing minute. Any last questions or, or comments? Are there still rebates for cars? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, we, we offer uh, incentives on our website. The state has some rebates and the federal tax incentive still exists, but it got a little more complicated with the recent legislation. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Super, super. No. Very well then. Okay, um, I think we did it. We are gonna manage to close our meeting on time, which is another accomplishment. <laughs> so thank you very much thank for being here. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.